This is Abe Friedhanser from Awards Radar, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with Josh Gad about Wolf Like Me. How are you, Josh? Doing great. Um, actually, uh, was just reading the scripts for season two of Wolf Like Me as we uh, uh, got on this call, and it's uh, it's always you're always praying and hoping that um, it will match, uh, but um, it's been a relief to see that it's surpassed all of my expectations. So, so getting excited about going back to Australia and, and uh, continue to play this uh, amazing character in this, in this incredible show. That's great. Well, I have a few questions to start. Did you expect that there would be a season two when the show started? Um, you know, I, the, <laughs> I've learned over the course of my career to temper all expectations and expect the unexpected. Um, you always hope and go into every job with the best of intentions, but really uh, until and unless an audience connects, you just never know. And it was um, a relief and a thrill to see that the audience um, connected uh, so vocally um, and fully on, on season one of the show. And when that happened, um, I think everybody just realized that there was more story to tell. And um, frankly, people who were excited to to engage in that story. What appealed to you most about it when you first heard about it? Um, you know, I was sort of a reluctant reader when I got sent the material because it was happening in the midst of um, the thick of the pandemic. Uh, we were still on lockdown. And the idea of taking a look at anything that took me away from my family and not only away from my family, but brought me to another continent where you have to do a two week lockdown uh, was um, something that, that wasn't that appealing. And it's, it's like that Al Pacino line from Godfather three, just when I think I'm out, they pull me back in where I read the first script and then subsequently read um, the other five uh, in one sitting. And I was like, Damn it. And I think what I responded to so much is each, like everything Abe Forsyth does, who was my partner in Little Monsters with Lupita Nyong'o, I, there's an originality to the storytelling that feels so fresh, so different, and so personal, and uh, equally funny and emotional. And with regard to Gary, there was something about, you know, growing up in a, in a family where my parents got divorced when I was very young and having a single parent, it, it was a, a sort of a touchstone for the rest of my life and something I really connected to. And this idea of, you know, being a father uh, to a girl who's going through uh, some incredible trauma and, and trying to sort of block yourself out of living life because you're so afraid of what that might mean and also learning to embrace chaos because it can be equally rewarding. It spoke to me thematically. And that was something that I really uh, related to and engaged with. What has it been like working with Isla Fisher? Dream come true. I, I, I have been a gigantic fan of Isla's for uh, going back to the first time I saw her in Wedding Crashers uh, and, you know, seeing this, the person I had never seen before uh, coming in and stealing every scene from like the, the best uh, there is in comedy. Um, it was always like a, a bucket list thing where I was like, I have to work with her. And we were actually circling a film um, uh, in the last few years that we were going to do. And then uh, this came along and I, I, I it was part of the selling point for me. Um, what I love so much about Isla is it, it, she really is one of those actors who um, keeps you on your toes and always forces you outside your comfort zone in a great way. Uh, and that's the way I like to play. And that's the way I like to um, operate. And so it was a really um, easy and fun experience because every scene we were doing in this incredibly insane uh, scenario was a trust exercise. And I always felt safe falling into her arms. What about Ariel Donahue? 
I mean, what is there to say? The kid is, is just such a discovery. And it's like, I remember I did a movie years ago called The Rocker. Um, and it was like this insane all-star cast um, of you know, Will Arnett and Bradley Cooper and Jeff Garland and Jane Lynch and the list went on and on. But there was one person in particular who I didn't know at all at the time. And I remember looking at Rain Wilson and saying, this kid is going to be the biggest star in the world. And that was Emma Stone. And I, I sort of felt the same way working with Ariel Donahue, where I'm just like, it's sort of like that Jodie Foster thing where she's wise beyond her years. And I, there wasn't a false moment either on screen or in the shooting of the series. Um, she's somebody who always listens and is in the moment. And it was incredibly important uh, to to this particular show, but also an amazing luxury because it doesn't always work that way. Once you got out of lockdown, was the experience of filming in Australia substantially different than a lot of what you've been used to in the past? Yeah, Australia is, um, is a place that I always uh, love coming back to. I, I was um, a student the first time I went there. I studied a semester at the National Institute of Dramatic Arts in New South Wales and fell in love with it. And then years later came back um, to do Little Monsters. And every time I go, it's always such a joy and a privilege. Um, but what made this experience extremely unique is at the time that I went, there was no COVID. So it was like exiting that two week lockdown was literally like exiting um, a module on a, on a lunar, in a lunar hotel and just like walking out into a, a different orbiting planet <laughs> where it was just like, what is happening? This is, nobody's wearing masks. Everybody's going into restaurants. People are going to movie theaters. Unfortunately, that, Freedom was short lived because while we were there, of course, inevitably COVID caught up with them. But it was uh, it was definitely an amazing uh, five week window where I got to live a pre pandemic lifestyle. And your reading material from when we started this interview, what can we expect from uh, season two? Oh, my God. Um, expect the unexpected. Uh, it, it zags every time you think it's going to zig. Uh, and it really challenges these characters in a way that I think is um, going to not only shock the audience, but, but take them on uh, a thrill ride that they can't possibly imagine. Um, you know, where we left off in season one is pretty high stakes. And this does not shy away from what it would be like if you found yourself not only in a relationship, spoiler alert, with a werewolf, but also one who is on the verge of giving birth. Um, and uh, and I just I can't wait. It's 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 rare that you read something and it and it it meets all of your expectations. But like I said before, this this is just exceeding everything. I had hoped for. I'm so glad to hear. And uh, since you mentioned Little Monsters before, I just want to say two things about that. Um, the first is the opening scene of that film. I always think back to as like it could be its own movie. This like uh, story <laughs> of a relationship. Like I want to see that full length, like two minutes into something. Um, but I also mentioned to my wife that I was talking to you, and she sent me a picture of you and her. I guess at the at a screening of Little Monsters uh, at Sundance, which I just thought was funny because I was Oh, no way. Oh, I wasn't hilarious. there. But, that's uh, <laughs> so funny. Let's tell your wife it, it was good to catch up. And uh, no, it was, that was uh, such a fun film to do because it was just, it was so subversive to how people think of me and know me. And just getting an opportunity to sort of send up that part of my career was uh, a blast. And as soon as I found out I was talking to you, I was like, oh, Avenue 5. That was like one of these unfortunate like pandemic renewal shows where like it's been way too long since we've heard about it. But it looks like the last news I saw is Bittersweet, which is that season two is filmed, but that's probably it. 
Well, we don't know. I mean, the truth is, is that our um, our contracts came up for renewal before we even shot season two. So it was more of a like a, a, a sort of forced issue. Um, I do know, though, that Armando is eager to continue telling stories um, beyond the season two. But should season two be the final season? I don't even know what to say. It's so batshit crazy in the most wonderful way that I think audiences are going to lose their mind. Um, Armando is operating on every cylinder and has, I think, really, really identified what this show is satirizing in a very clear and clinical way now that it just it shoots to the moon in terms of the comedy. And, and I, I, I think based on what I've seen sticks the landing. That's great. I was going to call it nutty, but I think that shit crazy is probably a little bit more, <laughs> more appropriate, especially because there's oh, yeah. some un unfiltered language on that show. So nutty is too. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. Uh, just you wait. Yeah. Very excited about it. Well, that's a good transition to talk about frozen another adult only, uh, you know, uh, project of yours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that something, is that, uh, you know, a lot of a role that you'd like to return to again in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think that it's a role that I always love going back to as long as there's a reason. Like, it, it, I think in terms of, you know, him just doing something to do something, uh, I, I think we're beyond that now. I think that it's got to be exciting. It's got to be original. And it's got to move the character forward. And it's what, frankly, what I loved about Olaf's journey in Frozen 2 was he grew. Um, and what I loved about the Olaf um, uh, original series we did, which sort of played off of that motif in the first one where he, re in the second movie where he recaps the first film, was it felt comedically distinct and it felt like something that had a purpose. So I think as long as there's a purpose, um, I, I'm happy to continue uh, playing this character. Um, he's one of my favorites, and 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 I, I just never want him to overstay his welcome. That's fair. I know another formative role of yours is in Book of Mormon. Do you like the fact that a lot of people immediately associate you with that? Uh, it's it. I do by virtue of the fact that I'm a Broadway baby. Like I I I got into this because theater was my heart and soul it's how i got my big break in uh, spelling bee um you know almost 20 years ago and and it's something that i i always long to go back to but it, it really speaks to um the effect and the pop cultural sort of milestone that that show became that people would associate me with something that only 1200 people a night ever saw um so it, it it just speaks to i think the power that the stage has had uh of late and and specifically i would say over the last 20 years i think we're in a golden age of of um of theater and in particular musical theater what else do you have coming up um some things I can't talk about, but, uh, you know, right now, very excited. We just put the finishing touches on uh, our third season of Central Park, uh, the musical that I co-created with Lauren Bouchard, who created Bob's Burgers. And I, I, I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's the proudest I've ever been, uh, certainly of that show. Um, I think we've done some remarkable episodes of television. Um, I can't wait uh, for uh, the return of Kristen Bell, who is... Uh, extraordinary in it, as is our amazing returning cast. Um, and uh, and yeah, right now, uh, getting some things in in order, but but focused entirely on on season two of of Wolf Like Me, and then um, watch this space for what's to come. Well, before I let you go, I have to ask you about another memorable uh, turn of yours from this past season, which is in Curb Your Enthusiasm. What was it like? <laughs> just tell me. I don't have a question. Just tell me about it. Wish fulfillment again. I mean, um, Larry David is somebody that I that is on my proverbial 
uh, entertainment Mount Rushmore and, you know, uh, have always thought that the, it's the funniest continuous show on television. Um, but to get to play in that world and to do so in such an unusual way was doubly thrilling because I think so often on that show, the joke of the celebrity coming on is they're, um, they're in contention with Larry. There, there's a, a layer of controversy between the characters uh, that you have to overcome. And what was so fascinating about my role is that it was the flip side of that, where it's like that rare circumstance where somebody learns from Larry all the wrong lessons, but learns nevertheless and adapts to Larry's influence. And I just thought that that was such a unique comedic perspective on Curb Your Enthusiasm. And it just felt fresh. And um, I unfortunately get asked almost on a, on a uh, weekly basis, if those were really my underwear, which is disturbing that people think that that's uh, what my undergarments look like. But nevertheless, um, it's I wear it as a badge of honor uh, because I, I have the the stamp of Larry David on my ass. There you go. Well, if there's not a better ending line to an interview, I don't know uh, what there could be. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh. This was great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.